like that Jeopardy tune. <laughs> Can I start now? All right. Um, let's open our Bibles to the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 1. And as you're turning there, um, let me just make you aware of uh, next Wednesday. This has nothing to do with Sunday, uh, but it does affect next Wednesday, which will be the 23rd. Um, there's a group here in our area, I think their name is called the Fort Bend Forum. I think that's, I think that's right. Does that sound right? And, um, you know, they host different speakers and things. And there's a man named Kelly Shackelford. They were trying to get some local churches here to host. And they couldn't because of the COVID and churches being shut down. So we as the elders decided, you know, that they could host here. Um, it's just we'd have to give up a Wednesday night Bible study. Which we don't like to do, but we felt like this was a good cause. Um, the gentleman's name is Kelly Shackelford. And I forgot what legal organization he is with, but he has a long history of, as a Christian attorney, uh, defending First Amendment cases. So he's going to actually be here next Wednesday night. I, I will be here. I will not be speaking. I'll be introducing him. And uh, we sort of felt like this was a good use of our time because, as you know, there's a lot of things going on in the culture related to the law and Christianity. Have you noticed that, by the way? <laughs> Christians, uh, particularly on the West Coast, you know, whole church is being shut down. So he's going to bring us up to speed on legal issues from a Christian perspective. So that's what's happening next week. And this meeting is going to be run primarily by the Fort Bend Forum. Um, they're just, and I, to my knowledge, we are going to be live streaming this for those out there that want to take advantage of this. So that's what's going on next next Wednesday, September twenty third. Other than that, everything else is normal, and we'll get back to our regular schedule the following Wednesday. Does that make sense? All right. But tonight we're. We're in the Bible. Is that okay with you guys? We can talk about the Bible tonight. Let's open up to the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 1. And as you know, the last um, two Wednesday nights, we started a study on the book of James. And what we went through is the background to the book. So those are the 11 questions we asked and answered. Who wrote it? James. Who was the author? Christ's half-brother. Who was the audience? A be believing Jews in the diaspora. Where was it written from? Jerusalem. When was it written? A.D. 44 to 47. And what's the occasion of the book? What's the purpose of the book? What's the book about? Well, really it's about not how to become a Christian but it's how to live as a Christian. And so we would call this a book not so much about positional righteousness, uh, but practical righteousness. So once a person is saved, how do they live for God in a way that their practical righteousness is pleasing to God? Our positional righteousness already is pleasing to God. But how do we let our practice catch up with our position? That's really what the book of James is about. So the dominant theme would be daily living, and it's a very practical book. And we talked about last time how the book is organized around faith and wisdom. Does any of this ring a bell? And if it doesn't, just say yes to make me feel better. So what we're moving into now is the actual verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the book of James. So we start with James chapter 1, verse 1, which is what we call the salutation. Salutation is a fancy name for greeting. And the greeting is found in verse 1. And here we have the writer mentioned and the audience. And so we'll go through this part of it 
fairly fast. But who is the writer? Notice, if you will, James chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed. So who is the writer? Well, it's this man, James. The problem is, when you learn Greek, it doesn't say James. (laughs) Uh, I've got the Greek word there. His name basically is Jacob. Uh, The Hebrews would, I guess, pronounce his Hebrew name as Yaakov or Jacob. You know, just like the Jacob you see in the book of Genesis. So, how in the world do we get James out of Jacob? I mean, why do we call it James? Why does every... Study Bible have on the top there the letter of James. Uh, Why is the English translation James? And you might find this history interesting. I find it very interesting. Let me just give it to you real fast. Um, The Greek, uh, the Hebrew name is Yaakov, and that name in Hebrew, which was James' name, it was Jacob. When it when it was translated from Hebrew into Greek, you get that name there that I have in brackets. One of the things that's interesting is the Greeks have no Y sounding letter. Uh, So the Y sound, Yaakov, was changed to an I sounding letter. And you see that I sounding letter, the very first letter in that word there that I've got in brackets. And so Yaakov became, if I'm pronouncing this right, um, Iakabas, if I'm pronouncing that right. Kind of like how the Hebrew name for Jesus, anybody know the Hebrew name for Jesus? Yeshua became, um, well we pronounce it as Jesus, but when you look at Jesus in Greek, it begins with, it begins with an I uh, sounding letter. So just as Yeshua became Jesus in the same way the the Y was changed to I as you move from Hebrew, James' name, because James originally, well not originally, for his whole life was Jewish. All of Christ's disciples were Jewish. His name was Jacob. And so when you take that Hebrew name and translate it into Greek, and you take into a fact that the Greeks have no Y sounding letter and they substituted I for Y. That's the name you get there in Greek for the name Jacob. Then what happened is that name was translated into Latin. So why in the world would they translate that name into Latin? Because around the fourth century, Jerome came up with what's called the Latin Vulgate. The Roman Empire had been on the scene for a long time and the dominant language that Rome brought in was Latin. And Jerome was trying to create a a, a version of the Bible that could be read in the common language and that's why it's called the Vulgate. Uh, In that word Vulgate you'll recognize the word vulgar which basically just means earthy or common. You know, today we use vulgar as a cuss word, but it really just means originally common. And so Jerome translated uh, the Greek and Hebrew into Latin in Jerome's Latin Vulgate around the 4th century. And as Latin evolved, the I sound, which you see here in Greek, was changed to J. So I changed to a J-sounding word as Latin evolved, and so you get this name, uh, Jacobus, if I'm pronouncing that right. Then Latin continued to evolve, and the B-sounding word in Latin was replaced by an M-sounding letter, and so you get this word, uh, or this name, Jacobus, Jacobus. And then when that word... Jacobus is translated into English, you get the word what? You get the word James. 
So where does this word James or this name James come from? It comes from going from the uh, Hebrew to the Greek to Latin to English. Now, Arnold Fruchtenbaum says this a lot better than I can, so let me just read what he says. Uh, In his Messianic epistles, he says this concerning the book of James. He says, the author's name appears as James in English Bibles, however, that is only the anglicized form. His real name in the Greek text is Jacob, the same as Jacob of of Genesis. So how did Jacob's name develop into James? The transition proceeded as follows. In Hebrew, Jacob is Yaakov. Since the New Testament was written in Greek and Greek does not have a Y sound, the Hebrew Y changed into an I sound in Greek. Thus in Greek, his name is Iakobos in the same way Yeshua The Hebrew for Jesus became um, the name that we have for Jesus in Greek. So that's where that name that I've got in brackets came from. Fruchtenbaum goes on and he says, however, the English form, James, which is what we know this character or this Bible writer by, however, the English form did not emerge directly from the Greek, but via the Latin And Fruchtenbaum doesn't explain here why they translated it into Latin. And I tried to give you that background through um, what's called the Latin Vulgate. However, the English form did not emerge directly from Greek, but via Latin. When his name was translated into Latin initially, it was similar to the Greek Iacobos. But as Latin evolved, Iacobos of Latin became another Latin form Jacobus, Jacobus, and as the Latin form progressed, the B changed to M. We're going to have a quiz on this after, by the way. And his name was Jacobus or Jacobus, and so finally the Latin Jacobus became the English name James. So that's kind of some interesting background, isn't it? Uh, the name James is not found originally in the Greek text, but it goes from taking Hebrew to Greek to Latin, to English. So if you want to be absolutely technical about it, the writer's name is really not James, it's Jacob. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, in his Messianic epistles, refers to him as Jacob slash James, just to avoid confusion. But that's where this name James comes from. So when you get into the salutation or the greeting, uh, we know who this man is, it's James. And you'll notice that he describes himself as a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word for bondservant is doulos, meaning a slave. So he considered himself, although he was the half-brother of Jesus Christ, as we've talked about, he considered himself a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, frankly, is what's always impressed me about the biblical writers, is they don't tout their credentials. I mean, if you were the half-brother of Christ, wouldn't you go around telling people about it? Particularly if you're trying to add authority to your book. Um, You'll notice that the biblical writers don't do that typically. They just call themselves slaves of Jesus Christ. And that's sort of convicting because in modern day ministry, when you look at people's websites and bios, they spend most of the time talking about themselves and their education and their experience and all of these kinds of things. And you'll notice James doesn't do that. He doesn't really want a lot of attention to go to himself. He just calls himself a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I tried that once. I was speaking at a conference and the guy said, well, how do you want me to introduce you? And I got convicted by what I'm talking about now. And I just said, well, why don't you just introduce me as the, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I could see he was kind of disappointed that I said that because he wanted to tout this kind of resume and wow everybody. But 
the fact of the matter is that's really all we are when you think about it. We would be nothing without Jesus Christ. And the only thing we really are as New Testament Christians is slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, a slave is not there to execute his own will, but he's there to execute the will of his master. And that's why we're on the earth. We're not here to execute our own will. We're here to execute the will of our owner because we are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on in the salutation and he gives the audience. The audience you already know a little bit about from our background. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Now, 12 tribes is very significant, so obviously he's writing to a Jewish audience. And this is important to understand because there's a lot of people running around. I even had some in seminary professors tell me this, that the 12 tribes are lost. The lost 12 tribes. And they think that when God brought discipline against the northern kingdom at the hands of the Assyrians in 722 BC, the 10 northern tribes were scattered and they've been lost uh, ever since 700 years before Christ. And you can see very fast that that theory is not true. I mean, even if they're lost to man, God knows where they are, right? So he addresses here the 12 tribes. I mean, how do you address the 12 tribes if they're lost? That doesn't make any sense. Um, Paul the Apostle in Acts 26 verse 7 makes a reference to the 12 tribes. So they weren't lost in Paul's day. And uh, there's a elderly prophetess waiting for the Messiah in Luke 2 verse 36 named Anna. And Luke 2 verse 36 gives us her tribal identity. She's from the tribe of Asher. So it says there was also a prophet Anna of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and obviously the tribes aren't lost because we can identify what tribe she came from 700 years after the tribes were supposedly lost. And the tribes aren't lost today. Um, we know that from genetics and DNA, but we also know it because the Lord in Revelation 7, verses 4 through 8, is going to raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists subsequent to the rapture of the church to preach the gospel to the whole world and you have the 12 tribes mentioned there in Revelation 7 verses 4 through 8. You know, 12,000 from each tribe, um, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000, from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000, Naphtali, 12,000, and you go right on down the list, and it says 12,000 from each tribe, and 12,000 times 12 is what? We've been doing homeschooling problems at our house, so I'm used to asking mathematical questions, is 144,000. So the bottom line is the tribes weren't lost in James' day, they weren't lost in Paul's day, they weren't lost in Christ's day, they're not lost today. And they're not, even if they are lost to man, which they're not, God knows where they are and God is going to use them again in the end times. So don't pay attention to mysteries of the Bible and A&E and the History Channel when they start blathering on and on about the lost tribes of Israel. So it says in the salutation, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. The word dispersed there is diaspora or scattered, meaning that they are, have been scattered outside the land of Israel. So who kicked them outside the land of Israel? Who kicked them out of the land of Israel? Anybody remember? 
Saul of Tarsus. That's in Acts 8, 3 and 4. And Acts 11, verse 19. Uh, that's when Saul became very angry. When Stephen made his speech condemning Israel historically and presently in Acts 7. It says in Acts 3, but, but Saul, uh, this is before his conversion in Acts 9, began ravaging the church, entering house to house, dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And then Acts 11 verse 19 says, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to the Jews alone. So outside of those places that are mentioned, the Jews went one of two places up north into north central Turkey, and they also went where? To Babylon. Why would they go to Babylon? That's where their kin were, because most of the Jews did not return from the Babylonian captivity. We've talked a little bit about that, haven't we? So they either went up north or they went to Babylon. I'm sort of of the view that James is writing to the folks, the scattered Hebrew Christians in Babylon, primarily because Peter later is going to address the folks up north. And so that would only leave the folks in Babylon unaddressed. And so I think James, Jacob James, is writing from Jerusalem to his parishioners. Because all these folks used to be in his church, the Jerusalem church, who were scattered by Saul of Tarsus into Babylon. Um, this, and so that's what's meant by this word, dispersed. Uh, the word there is diaspora. So the diaspora means Jews. In this case, it's Hebrew Christians, believers in Yeshua, living outside the land of Israel. And in Babylon is probably where they were living. The word diaspora is only used three times in the Greek New Testament. And every single time it refers to Jews living outside the land. In other words, it's a technical term which always refers to Jews living outside the land. Let me give you those references. There's just three of that Greek word, diaspora. The first one is in John 7, verse 35, which says, The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go? We cannot find him. Will he go where our people live? Scattered, that's the word diaspora, among the Greeks and teach the Greeks. The second reference is in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, where Peter says to those who reside as aliens scattered, that's the second use of the word diaspora, throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia, and Asia who are chosen. So those are the ones that made their way up north into north central Turkey. And Peter would address them, and it would make sense that Peter would address those Jews living there, because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter was the apostle to who? To the Jews. So we believe both Peter letters are written to also the diaspora Jews living in north central Turkey. And then the third use of the word diaspora is right here in James chapter 1 verse 1 which refers to the scattered Jews, thanks to Saul of Tarsus, living in the Babylon area. So the bottom line is because the word diaspora is a technical word, meaning it always means the same thing every time it's used, we believe that this book was written by Jacob James, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, to his scattered flock in the area of Babylon between the Euphrates and the Tigris, modern day Iraq, and James is addressing them because he was their, is their pastor, and they're concerned about practical righteousness. James wants to address that issue, 
And they got kicked out of there from Israel into Babylon thanks to the persecution brought against the early church, which was all Jewish, by Saul of Tarsus. So James, therefore, says to those folks, to the 12 tribes dispersed, greetings. Greeting is a salutation. He's sending his greetings. And so that takes us outside of verse 1. And once we get outside of verse 1 and into verse 2, we move into the first half of the book, which is basically teaching these people to live by faith outside of the land. So the first part of the book is James chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 12, when he, where he says, a practical righteousness that pleases God is a righteousness that lives by faith. Now in the second part of the book, beginning in chapter 3, verse 13, through the end of the book, he'll get into the subject of wisdom, which is knowledge what? Knowledge applied. He'll deal with that later, but that's not what he's dealing with in the first part of the book. He's dealing with trusting God through all kinds of circumstances. So he wants these people who are already saved to continue to walk by faith as they walk through trials, chapter 1, verse 2 through verse 18, as they obey God's word, chapter 1, verse 19 through verse 27, as they not show favoritism in the assembly or the synagogue, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, as they allow their not saving faith, but what? Serving faith, remember that, to demonstrate itself through good works. Chapter 2, verse 14 through verse 26. And the ultimate good work you can do is what? Keep your mouth shut, that's what he's saying. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Because if you can master that good work, all the other good works are easy. That's the hardest thing for us to do. So that basically is the outline for the first half of the book. So this evening, as time permits, we're going to look at the subject of trials. How do you live a life as a Christian where your practice catches up with your position? Where you're not just pleasing to God in terms of your position, but you're pleasing to God in your daily life to the point where he really doesn't have to bring discipline upon you. How do you do that exactly? Well, the first thing you do is you develop the right perspective on trials or adversity. So he's going to deal with this in chapter 1, verse 2 through verse 18. And that section has two major parts to it. He's teaching his readers and us by extension how to rejoice during trials. Chapter 1, verse 2 through verse 12. And then he is going to teach us how not to charge God foolishly in the midst of trials. He'll do that in chapter 1, verse 13 through verse 18. Because the problem with us is when we run into difficulty, we always want to blame God. And we want to say God is trying to wreck my life. God is trying to destroy me. And so that we don't adopt that mindset, he deals with that in chapter 1, verse 13 through 18. We won't obviously get to that tonight, but we will start this first part of this section where he teaches us that to achieve a practical righteousness that's pleasing to God, we need to develop a mindset where we rejoice in the midst of adversity. So, why should I rejoice in the midst of adversity as a New Testament Christian? Three reasons. Number one, trials produce something. God produces things in our lives in the midst of trials that cannot and will not be produced any other way. Those things are patience and maturity. So when I go through adversity, I should rejoice in the midst of it because I have a promise from God that God is using that circumstance to produce patience and maturity in me. 
Number two, and that's in verses two through eight. Number two, trials produce intimacy and dependence upon God, verses nine through 11. So isn't it interesting that our prayer life has a tendency to pick up some in terms of frequency and intensity when things are difficult? Can I get an amen on that? Because when things are going well, I have a tendency to say, Lord, I've got this under control. I'll check in with you when I need you. But when you go through a trial, it's different. Because now you have to depend upon the Lord to get through it. And so the trial itself will push you into the arms of Jesus. If you don't become embittered at God in the midst of it. And then the third reason we should rejoice in the midst of trials is verse 12, where we are promised that believers will be rewarded in the next life for enduring trials in this life because the psalmist says God keeps our tears in a bottle. In other words, he keeps a record of our sufferings. And the day will come in the next life for he will reward you for every single injustice or adversity that you suffered in this life. So when you keep those three things in your mind, when you hit a trial, it's easy to rejoice in the midst of it. So having said all that, let's start with our first one here. Number one, why should we rejoice in the midst of trials? Because trials produce patience and maturity. So we pick it up there with verse two. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So joy, I don't think is the same thing as happiness. Uh, happiness comes from the word happenstance, from hap or luck. The world will say you can experience tranquility and peace when things are going well. Joy, and we talked about a lot of this in the book of Philippians when we were going through that on Sunday morning. Joy is the ability to experience the peace of God, to experience a deep down abiding that God is in control when things go south or when things become difficult. That's what joy is. So when you enter into a valley in your life, James says, consider it all joy. He doesn't just say, consider it joy. He says, consider it all joy. Which is the exact opposite reaction that you get from people that are worldly and don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them. They don't even have the foggiest idea how to tap into this. Because it's something that can only be tapped into through the resources of God. That's why James says, consider it all joy, my what? Brethren. Is he speaking to believers or unbelievers? Believers. Only the believer has the resources necessary to rejoice in the midst of adversity. Unbeliever doesn't have the foggiest clue. It uh, reminds me of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 11, and 12, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Re verse 12, rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So as a maturing Christian, how are we supposed to react when people insult you? You ever been insulted? We all have. Persecuted, people go around. Social media gives people lots of opportunities to do this this day and age and, and insult you and run YouTube videos against you <laughs> and say all kinds of things about you that aren't true. What do, you, what do you do in the midst of that? I mean, my carnal reaction is to well, I'm going to make my own video, and I'm going to get them back. No, what the Bible says, you're supposed to rejoice in the midst of that. By the way, make sure you're being persecuted for the right reasons. All kinds of evil against you because of me. Many people are persecuted just because they're obnoxious. We had a situation in a college uh, not far from where I grew up, 
and there were some Christians there that would uh, get these big uh, bullhorn kind of things and microphones. And they would, as the students were going in and out of class, they would scream like hellfire and brimstone at the students. You know, repent, turn and turn or burn, all this stuff. Some of them even painted their clothes like fire and their cars and just weird, weird stuff. And then the administration would clamp down on them and they would say, well, we're being persecuted for the Lord. No, you're not being persecuted for the Lord. You're being persecuted because you're acting like a total idiot is the reason you're being persecuted. So when you're being persecuted, make sure it's for the right reasons. He said, persecuted because of me, but when it happens, not if, but when, because 2 Timothy 3.12 says it's impossible for all to live a godly life in Christ Jesus without being persecuted, right? All who, 2 Timothy 3.12, all who seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. At some point, you're going to be treated unfairly or slandered or whatever, passed over for a promotion, whatever the issue is, by someone. So when it happens, uh, what he says there is rejoice and be glad. And that's what James is saying. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when, whenever you encounter various trials. Now, <clears throat> think about this for a minute. What trial was this immediate audience experiencing? They had been persecuted by Saul of Tarsus. It describes what happened to them, dragging them off, putting some of them in prison, kicking them out of the land of Israel into the diaspora. So you, you lose your home. Perhaps you're disconnected from your family. You lose your employment. And you can see why this audience is struggling with why, how do we react in the midst of this? And so James, their pastor, writes to them and says, when these kinds of things happen to, to you, consider it all joy. Now, you might be reading this and saying, well, that's their circumstance. That doesn't relate to me. You know, I haven't lost my job. I haven't lost my house. I haven't lost my country. I haven't been exiled. So I guess this doesn't apply to me. Well, look very carefully at what James says. He uses language that's broad enough to go outside of the immediate context of his readers to any trial a person experiences as a New Testament believer because he says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter what kind of trials? Various trials. So you'll notice that there are various trials. You'll notice that trials and difficulties is not a one-size-fits-all. There are all kinds of problems that we go through at all kinds of different levels. The word various there, it's very interesting that when you study this in Greek, that word was used in the Septuagint the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to describe the coat of many colors, remember, that Jacob put on Joseph that invoked the brother's jealousy. And so when the Septuagint translators wanted to describe that coat of many colors, they used this word various, same word that's used here. So the point is, trials are sort of technicolor. It's like all the different colors of a rainbow. There are all kinds of trials God puts you through in, time, in terms of scope, size, degree. Maybe one year it's a physical problem. Maybe the next month it's a relational problem. Maybe the month after that it's a financial problem. It's the idea that God is using all of these multicolored various trials to mold and shape our character in a particular way. So I might have a particular blot in my character that only a certain piece of sandpaper can fix. And God knows what piece of sandpaper is going to fix that problem. And he knows how to use the exact trial 
at the exact time in our life to round off that particular deficiency, not in our position, but in our what? In our practice. So that's what's meant here by various trials. So you might say, well, their trial is different than mine. Well, James uses language that's broad enough to include kind of like a rainbow, multicolored issues. Uh, 1 Peter 4 verse 10 uses the same word various to describe the various forms of God's grace. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So when you use your spiritual gift or gifts, a certain color comes out in the grace of God in his church. When the person next to you uses their spiritual gift or gifting, another color comes out. And if all of us are using our spiritual gifts in harmony with each other, you've got a multicolored, technicolor rainbow. That's the same word various, 1 Peter 4, verse 10, that's used here in James chapter 1, verse 2. So when you encounter any of these trials, James says, consider it not just joy. Consider it all joy. And obviously, when he says, my brethren, this is something that could only apply to a Christian. Because only a Christian would have the resources necessary to rejoice in the midst of adversity. What could an unbeliever know about it? Nothing. So why in the world when I encounter a trial of various kinds or trials of various kinds, why in the world would I ever think about rejoicing in the midst of it? Because his point here in verses 2 through 8 is what that trial is going to produce. Well, what exactly is it going to produce? It's going to produce two things. Number one, it is going to produce patience, verse 3. Number two, it is going to produce maturity, verse 4. So show me a Christian that never goes through these various trials, and I will show you a Christian that has no patience or endurance in daily life, and I will show you also a Christian who is lacking in maturity. So when we go through these trials, we're to rejoice because it's producing automatically these two things. So look at verse 3, patience, and then we'll move to verse 4, maturity. Notice what verse 3 says, knowing, very important word, That the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, you'll notice here that it says the testing of your faith. That means his audience already has what? Faith. You can't test something that doesn't exist, right? So that's a clear evidence that he's writing to Christians or believers. He's not dealing with them in the first tense of their salvation, but in the what? Second tense of their salvation. So using the quote from Lewisbury Chafer that we put up at the end of last time, James here is not dealing with saving faith, but what? Serving faith. He's not dealing with saving faith, but what? Sanctifying faith. And I like the way Lewisbury Chafer puts this, the justified one, having become what he is by faith, must go ahead living on the same principle of utter dependence upon God. So this is not evangelism here. This is how to get saved people to keep living on the faith that they already have and move on into maturity because what you'll discover in the Christian life is faith is like a muscle. And if you go back to 24-hour fitness without having been there for five years. Now, that fits me pretty well because I went in there with kind of a he-man attitude thinking I could go back and do stuff I did in my 20s. And ooh, did that make me sore for a couple weeks. I'm barely getting over it. Now, why was I so sore? Because these muscles were not being used for a long period of time. So they were atrophying. 
So a muscle only gains strength in the natural world when it's consistently used. You know the saying, if you don't use it, you what? You lose it. Well, isn't that true with faith? I mean, how is your faith ever supposed to go to the next level if you never are put in a circumstance where you have to trust God for problems? I mean, it's only until God puts into your life something that's too big for you that you have to trust God to get through it is the faith muscle being exercised. And so this is what James is talking about when he's talking about the testing of your faith. So what does the trials produce? It produces the testing of your faith. And then he says that in turn produces what? What does it say? Verse 3. Endurance. Or patience. Uh, the Greek word endurance here is hupomene. And it has to do with the ability to endure as a Christian in whatever God has called you to do in the midst of adverse and unfair treatment. Hupomene is something that's sorely lacking in the body of Christ today. Because your average Christian, when they join a church, they figure out pretty fast that the church is not perfect. And by the way, if you find a perfect church, don't join that church because your imperfection will ruin that church. Amen? And so the first relational problem, the first disappointment they have, boom, they're out the door and they're off to the next church. And then a little time will pass and generally what happens is the same circumstances occur somewhere else, the trial's a little different, and then they'll boom, they're off to the next church. And so there's just a lack of steadfastness, or what we would call hupomene, endurance under trial. And yet, this is what God is trying to produce in us. He's trying to get us to the point where we're enduring difficulty for His glory. That, by the way, is one of the fruits, fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Paul gives the definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, and he says love is patient. Love is kind, it is not jealous, it is not brag, it is not arrogant, etc. So one of the things that God wants to produce in us is patience. Have you ever prayed, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now? It doesn't work that way, right? Patience comes through having a multicolored trial come into your life and you have to trust God through it. That's where patience comes from. And that's why James says, when you hit that trial, rejoice. Because look at what God is going to do now in your life. He's going to produce patience. He's going to get you to exercise that faith muscle. And those opportunities wouldn't be there without the trial. Because let's be honest, we really don't trust God unless we have to, right? I mean, I don't. I'd rather, I'd rather do anything than trust God, to be frank with you. I'd rather figure everything out myself and execute things in my own strength. And I can get pretty good at that in my flesh. Then God says, well, let's fix that. We'll fix that problem. We'll give you a, we'll give you a problem that you can't handle. And then we go into anxiety because we can't fix the problem. And then finally, as a last resort, we'll say, Lord, can you help me with this? And the Lord says, that's the response I wanted at the beginning. So now we're going to exercise your faith muscle, and you're going to learn patience. Now, without the trial, you can't learn patience. So when you hit the trial, James says, rejoice in it. And you'll notice this word knowing. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So this is a promise from God. When you hit a trial, if you're open to the leading in the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, God will use that to build into you something that's not there naturally called patience. And then as patience is allowed to have its work, it leads to maturity. 
where do we see maturity? It's in verse 4. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, the way the New American Standard Bible says this is allow or let. Let endurance have its result. In fact, the word have there in Greek is a command. It's what you call a Greek imperative. And he's telling me, under stress, let God do what he wants to do. Which implies that I have the ability, as a New Testament Christian, to shut down the process. I mean, if it's telling me as a command, let patience have its result, that means I must have an ability as a New New Testament Christian to not let patience have its result. Does that make sense? It wouldn't be a command if I didn't have the ability to close it down or shut it down. Because a command implies I have the ability to disobey the command. It reminds me of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19 which says, Do not quench the spirit. How do you quench the spirit in your life? You don't cooperate with the Lord in the midst of trials. You, you don't let it make you better. You become instead what? Bitter. And to be frank with you, I would say this, 75 to 80% of American Christians are just right there. Because they've been taught a version of Christianity where Christianity is kind of a life of ease and prosperity, a life of self-empowerment, And when they hit an adversity, they think God has cheated them because they've been mistaught. Or they're just angry at God because how could God allow this to happen? And they close down the process. They don't let patience have its work. And they stay in the same place of immaturity for decades. And then God tries to get their attention again by putting them into another problem, and they have the same result. And they don't get closer to God, they get further away from God. I think that's what it means when it says, do not quench the spirit. It has to do with how we're going to react in the midst of adversity. You, to a large extent, can't control the adversity that comes into your life. Unless you bring it on yourself through dumb decisions. But that's not what James is talking about here. He's talking about adversity beyond our control. These people had been kicked out of their land, kicked out of their homes. They're living in the diaspora. They didn't ask for this, but that's what happened to them. And they have no control over the adversity that just happened to them. But here's what you can control. You can control your reaction to the adversity. That's totally within your control. And that determines whether you're going to be a growing Christian. How you respond to it determines whether you're going to be a growing Christian or a stagnant Christian. So let patience have its perfect work because that in turn is going to put you into a situation so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The Greek there for complete or lacking in nothing is teleos which means the end it doesn't mean sinless it means you sin less it means you're growing up you're maturing you're no longer sucking your thumb you're out of the diapers you're actually like we did with our daughter when she was just learning to walk she Obviously, as a toddler, can't, can't walk without parental support. But now, how exciting it is when she's walking on her own. So, that's what it means, teleos, maturity, lacking in nothing. We're on, the, we're on the road to growth here. So, that's what happens when we allow trials to have the work that God wants to do in us through those trials. Patience is developed, verse 3. Maturity starts to be Develop verse 4 and that's why James verse 2 says when you hit the trial rejoice because look at what God's going to do through it 
You're going to become a more patient person than you were last year because of your trial in 2020. And you're, begin- you're going to become a more mature, spiritually speaking, person than you were last year because of your trial in 2020. So James says rejoice. Now this is the problem with, with drugs. This is why our society is hooked on drugs. Even if I can, I'm not a medical doctor, but even many so-called prescription drugs that people are on, alcohol, all of these kinds of things, what are they trying to do? They're trying to numb the pain. They're trying to pretend like the pain is not there by injecting or ingesting or drinking or whatever, some sort of substance into them which numbs the pain. And so as they're numbing the pain, what is happening? All those years of maturity are forfeited because God uses the pain to bring us to maturity. So if you get yourself involved with something that denies the pain or numbs you up where the pain doesn't exist, then all those years of maturity where you could have been maturing are forfeited. See that? That's why when you talk to people, I know people even going back to high school that were on drugs and things like that all of the time. You, you talk to them today and they're basically like emotional infants because they have forfeited all of those years of growth, which they could have had. And I'm not here to give medical advice about what drugs legally people should be on or not. I'm just saying, think about it. When you're living in a culture that's saying, take this pill, take this shot, the goal would be to numb the pain. Well, who ever said that all pain is bad? I mean, obviously, God can use pain. And here I'm primarily talking about emotional pain to take us to the next level of faith. So, gee, Pastor Andy, I sure don't think like this. I sure don't rejoice in the midst of my trials. So what should I do? How in the world do I get myself into a position where I have the mind of God that you're describing in the midst of trials? Because I don't have it naturally. Well, I'm so glad you asked because James tells you exactly how to get it. What does he say in verse 5? But if any of you lacks wisdom, what wisdom? The mind of God on trials. I don't have the mind of God on trials. I don't react with rejoicing in the midst of trials. So how do I get the divine perspective? James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask who? Your counselor? No. Dr. Phil? No. Let him ask who? Let him ask God. Now, isn't that interesting? How we'll go and talk to everybody and anybody about our problems except the Lord when it's only the Lord that can give us the right perspective on problems. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, is God really going to give wisdom to little old me? Well, look at the rest of verse 5. Who gives to all generously, wow, without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if readers lack this perspective, they should ask in faith of God, and he will give them his point of view on trials. Now, is God in the wisdom business? I mean, if you ask God for wisdom on something, is God the type of God that answers that request? Well, you don't have to look far in the Bible to see that God gives wisdom beyond our abilities to many people. Remember what he did for Solomon? 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night and said, Ask what you wish me to give to you. Now, how would you like that dream? How would you like God to show up at a dream tonight in your mind and say, Ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you? That's in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. So what does Solomon ask for? Verse 9, 
So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people and discern between good and evil. So Solomon had become the second king, I'm sorry, the third king of the United Kingdom. He reigned for 40 years. He was probably very young at this point in his tenure. And he said, well, the only thing I really want from you, Lord, is I just want wisdom on how to be a king. I mean, how do I do the job? And so God answers verse 12, 1 Kings 3, Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given to you a wise and discerning heart so that no one like you before you nor shall one be like after you will, will arise after you. In other words, you're going to be unique, Solomon. I'm going to give you wisdom. Hey, that's why Solomon authored three books of the Old Testament. Uh, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon first, Proverbs second, Ecclesiastes third. Why would Solomon write three books of the Old Testament? Because God gave him wisdom. Solomon was involved in many poems and Proverbs, and he was involved in zoology and botany and all kinds of literature. Why? Because he asked God for wisdom. And then God says this, I have also given you what you have not asked for. See, Solomon could have asked for riches and honor. He could have asked for the death of his enemies. Solomon never asked for any of that. He just said, give me wisdom so I can govern your people. And God says, not only am I going to answer that request, but I'm going to answer all of the other requests that you never asked for. I have given you what you asked, 1 Kings 3.13, both riches and honor, so there, there, will not, uh, there will not be any among you the kings like you in all your days. So you read a story like that and you say, wow, God is in the wisdom business. God wants to give wisdom. Now, in this context, it's dealing with wisdom and trials. There's a specific context here. But I believe that almost any matter you inquire of God of, as is true in the case of Solomon, God will give you his wisdom if you really want it on that matter. This context, though, is dealing with wisdom or Sophia or Hokama or right standing, right understanding concerning trials. And is God going to hold out on us when we ask that kind of thing of him? No. Verse 5 says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all what? generously and without reproach and it will be given to him well gee don't i have to be a member of sugarland bible church to get that kind of wisdom no god gives it without reproach well no don't i have to uh, be an elder or deacon to get that kind of wisdom don't i have to be a pastor no god gives it to everyone who wants it without reproach well, don't I have to be walking with the Lord for 800 years to get this? No. God gives it to anyone who asks it without reproach. Because God shows no partiality. Acts 10 verse 34. Romans 2 verse 11. There is no partiality with God. See, God is not like a person where you kind of have to butter him up a little bit. Get on their good side. Maybe give them a few compliments. Maybe schmooze a little bit. And then you can get what you want. That's not the way God is. God doesn't care your status, your standing, your, where you live, what neighborhood, your socioeconomic bracket. He is so interested in giving wisdom to anybody that wants it. He'll give it. And so that's how you get the divine perspective on trials which produce patience and endurance as we walk through these trials so that we can rejoice in the midst of these trials and if I'm not rejoicing in the midst of my trials maybe I need to ask God for his mind on the subject see if I'm just getting angry at God from going through trials maybe I don't have his mind on it and if I don't have his mind on it maybe I should ask for his mind on it, and he'll give it without reproach. In fact, that's what he's doing here. 
in verses 2 through 5. But when I ask, am I supposed to ask a particular way? And yes, you are. And I can't talk about it right now because we're out of time. But we'll pick it up there in verse 6. Not next week because we're going to be getting wisdom from the legal world next week. But the following week. When you ask of God, you have to ask a particular way. It's not even a particular way. You've got to ask with a particular attitude. Because your attitude determines your what? Your altitude with God. It's all about attitude. So if I'm coming to God with the wrong attitude, he won't answer me. But if I come to God with the right attitude, he will answer. And so we'll see that next time. Uh, If people got to go collect their young ones, now would be a good opportunity to do that. And anybody want to stick around for Q&A, we can...